God. Uh, say it. I am special to God. Now say it like you believe it. I am special to God. Now say it like you really mean it. I am special to God. That doesn't mean you take the special bus. It means that you're special to God. Amen? Amen. Special. God thinks highly of you. He values your life. We celebrated communion this morning. We remember the great love that He has towards us. And the fact that He doesn't just love us, but that He sought us out to save us. You know, there's a few stories that we find, parables that Jesus tells in the Bible. And they talk about how special we really are to God. They're not my main focus of this morning, but I'd like to kind of open with them. The first is found in Matthew 13, 45 to 46. Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay, you're so special to God that like a guy who's out searching out, a, a man who knows his pearls, a man who knows his, his business goes out and he finds that one pearl that has such great value that he's willing to sell everything he has in order to buy it. Can you imagine someone selling home, land, property, cars, whatever they have, so they could buy one item? That's how valuable that item was to him. That's how valuable we are to God. Luke 15, 4-7 talks us about the lost sheep. It says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. You know, interesting, I always found that story interesting to think that, you know, sometimes we almost have this kind of concept. Well, if one person wanders off and gets lost and falls off by the wayside, we can't leave the whole 99 and stop protecting them for that, one, for that one other person. That's their fault for doing that. That's kind of the attitude we tend to have these days. But no, Jesus says, for that one, he would go as far to find to search every crevice, every crag, every cave, to find that one sheep that had wandered away. Jesus also says in the Word, says, I have come to seek and save that which was lost. Then there's the parable of the lost coin. Luke 15, 8 to 10. It says, or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. How diligent, you know, I remember a couple years ago, I was looking at our passports and I realized that I had my wife's and I had my passport, but I couldn't find Victoria's passport. And, you know, those are kind of a pain in the neck to get to order and stuff. I'm like, where's her passport? And I began looking for it. I'm like, I'll come back to it later. And then there was something else that came by and I felt like I needed to look for, for the passport. And I remember going through, bless you, I remember going through all of my, my file drawers on my desk and I ripped them apart. Looked through every one, fine, trying to find that passport. I couldn't find it. I'm like, I don't know where this thing is. It'll show up. We had moved, and I thought we were moving. I went through another time, and I was actually cleaning out things and reorganizing everything. Went searching for that passport, looked and looked. And I, mean, I spent a couple of hours trying to find that thing. I remember going up to a room, looking in her drawers. Did she take it? Is it up there? Where's that passport? Diligently, just frustrated because I couldn't find that passport. Came again when we moved here. Went looking for it again one last time to see why isn't it showing up? I just figured it was it just kind of turned up or something. Never seemed to turn up. I was always frustrated. The other day I asked my wife to look for something in my desk drawer. And she's like, hey, I found Victoria's passport. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy. Now I can go out of country or something, you know? Isn't that what everybody's threatening depend on who wins the elections this year? <laughs> All depends on who you want. So, but, uh, you know, Jesus searches diligently for hearts that are seeking for him. Jesus searched diligently for you and I. He values us that much. We, we said it during communion this morning. you got to think that the king of the universe, God Almighty, the one who created us, left heaven and came down to earth and became like us. It's kind of like, like if we made, it's far deeper than this, but it's kind of like if we made a Lego creation 
or, or, or a clay creation and stuff, and then went down and became like the Legos or like the clay to become like one of them to understand how they felt, like a Lego can feel. But that's what Jesus did for us. He left God Almighty Spirit, eternally existent, always was, always will be, always, always is, came down and became just like us, took our flesh upon us. He went that far, went to that kind of a distance, and then paid a price with his own life to buy us back from the curse of sin. Why? Because we're special to God. Say it again. I am special to God. I am special to God. We are special to God. So special. He doesn't even consider us his servants, but he considers us his friends. Now, if you turn with me to my main text this morning, John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 14 to 16. I want to read some things that Jesus speaks to us. He says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Talk about one thing this morning. We are chosen by Christ. Chosen by Christ. Jesus chose you. You might think, well, no, I chose Jesus when I asked him into my heart. Jesus had already chosen you. You understand that? I remember back when we were in school, and they used to line us up against the wall, and they'd pick two captains, and they'd say, let's pick teams. Anybody remember that? Anybody hated that? I hated that. I was a little chubby kid, and stuff, so I got picked last all the time. I want him on my team. He can't run fast. <laughs> you know, we didn't like it when they went through and they picked, picked which one they wanted on their team. Now, it came something with Bible at church. I got picked first. You know, it's like, it's like we pick those we think we can win, those winners, those losers, whatever it might be. We always, whether we hated it or agonized over it, it was always nice if someone chose us to be on their team. It was always a bummer if you were last and you're like, okay, I guess you're on that team. <laughs> Y'all know what that's like. Come on. Or you saw someone who knew what that was like. It's kind of like when you go to high school and there's that in-group, you know, the populars. Everybody says, you know, I don't want to be a part of the populars. They're just stuck up, but everybody really does want to be a part of the populars. Otherwise, they wouldn't be the populars. (laughs) But you don't get to pick to be in the populars. The populars pick you. Well, I have news for you. The king of the universe picked you. The king of the universe chose you. It doesn't matter if an employer chose you or somebody else. It doesn't matter if the populars rejected you or chose you. It doesn't matter if a girl chose you or not or a guy chose you or not. Those things don't matter. What matters is that the king of the universe has chosen us. He has the Greek word for choose there is to pick out, to select, to elect, to seek out. Why? Because he finds value in our lives. Before the beginning of time, the Word tells us, He chose us to be His. And He didn't just choose us <coughs> for a task or choose us to be a servant, but He chose us to be His friends. There's something very important about that. Because to be chosen to be a servant is different than to be chosen to be a friend, isn't it? I would much rather be chosen as a friend than chosen as someone who just has to serve. You know, a servant just simply obeys the commands of a master. A servant sometimes might be chosen for ability or, or, or what they can bring to the table or strength. But they're not really considered. They're not really shared with. The master doesn't, doesn't share his will with the servant. He just shares what the servant's supposed to do. He doesn't tell him why you need to do it. He just says, do it and you have to do it. But when you're a friend, it's a little bit different. Because friends respond to one another. Friends share purpose and plan. Friends come to know each other's hearts. And Jesus didn't choose us as servants, but he chose us as friends because he wanted to share his heart with us. He wanted to share what mattered to him and what really matters ultimately to Jesus other than the lost being found. What matters ultimately to him other than his name being proclaimed in all this earth so that way those who are hurting, so that way those who are lost, 
those who are bound up with the sins of this world, those who are struggling, that they might find truth. That's his true heart. He's moved with compassion when he saw the multitudes without a shepherd. And he comes and he makes us his friends. And he says, I want you to feel my heartbeat. I want you to know who I am. I don't want to just tell you to go do something, but I want you to feel my heart to know what I'm feeling when I look at the lost. He's chosen us to share that message of hope and compassion with others. And in that, he gives us a purpose. You see, he chose us for a reason. Because the next thing he goes on to say in that passage, he says, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you. And then he says, and I have appointed you, or I have ordained you. This week I had the privilege of being at District Council in Salt Lake City, where the ministers from around the Rocky Mountain District We get together, we conduct business, but on Wednesday night we had an ordination service. And during that ordination service, there were some 20 people who are in the class, 20 people who are ordained, recognized as being chosen by God to go out and to truly spread the gospel. But you know, in reality, God chooses each one of us. We had the privilege of uh, Larry Naomi's daughter was in that ordination group and stuff this uh, past Wednesday night. But in reality, each one of us is still appointed, chosen by God for the right here, for right now, in this time, in this moment, for His purpose and for His pleasure. He wants us to be a part of His vision. He wants us to catch His heartbeat. He doesn't want us to be servants going, okay, I guess i got to do this, I guess i got to do that. But He's chosen us to appoint us. You know, appointment means responsibility. Amen? Amen? Amen. When you're appointed to something, that usually means you're given a responsibility, doesn't it? I know that anymore, it seems like we look at people who are appointed to positions, it seems like they neglect their responsibilities. But really, when you're appointed or ordained, chosen, you're appointed for responsibility. We have responsibilities as the people of God. Because God's appointed us. He's ordained us. He knows His plans for us, and He knows what He wants to do with us. You know, I remember about a year and a half ago or so, it was the day before I was getting ready to, um, to, to resign uh, the last church that we were at in Louisiana. And I was riding through a bike. It was a warm day in February. Note that. A warm day in February. A little humid even. And so when I was riding my bike through the neighborhood, and as I was riding it, I was just thinking, it's like, you know, God knew this day would exist. God knew this day in my life. I didn't know this day in my life, but God knew this day in my life. God knew that the next day I was going to I was gonna close out my ministry at a church, something that my wife and I had prayed about for a couple of months, fasted and prayed about and sought him very diligently before we did. And uh, I said, I didn't know where my next step was. I didn't know where I was going after that, what the next place that God would have for me was. But God made himself very real to me and, and reminded me of that day when he says, you know, I've chosen you and I've ordained you and that you would go and bear fruit, that your fruit would remain. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in that moment, I, I was very aware that though I did not know where my next step was, God did because he had appointed me for my next step. I never knew I'd be in Fort Lipton, Colorado, shivering on the first day of May. <laughs> which I'm thankful to be doing. I just want to let you know that. It's a lot prettier than the bayou. But I never knew what was ahead. I didn't know that the next several months of my life would, would, would mean staying with family while my father-in-law was sick and, and was passing away. And I didn't realize that two days after my father-in-law's funeral or memorial service, that I would actually have contact with the next church that would be the church that God would bring me to the pastor. I didn't know that. I didn't know that that, that the monies he gave us to sustain us would hold out right until my very first paycheck where I came from would be just sufficient for the time. But I look back and I think now that that day that I was riding in the bayou on that bike when I didn't know what was ahead of my life, that God knew all along what the plan was. He knew what his plan was to get me to where he wanted me, to place me in the place that he wanted me to be, because he had appointed me for such a time as this. Now i got to tell you, I say all that to say, God has appointed you to not just come and sit in a church. But he's brought you to this church for a reason. He's brought you into this fellowship. He's brought you here for a purpose. He has a design in place for our lives. He has a purpose in place for our lives. He, he has brought us together. And if we would just listen to his teaching and listen to what he's taught us, he wants to use us. If we'll obey him, what does he say? He says, you are my friends if you do those things which I command you. And how do you know that sometimes the commands of God, we have the commands of God that we have in His Word that we need to follow. But we also know that God speaks into our hearts the things He wants us to do for Him, that He also wants us to follow those things and to follow through. Why has He appointed us? But He has appointed us to bear fruit. You know, there are three kinds of fruit that we find in Scripture. The first one is spiritual fruit. 
spiritual fruit. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. He's appointed us to bear this fruit. Why? Because this fruit doesn't really exist in the world on its own. But we're called as the church to bear this fruit before others. To bear His love, to bear His joy, to bear His peace, to bear His patience, His kindness, His goodness, His faithfulness, to bear His gentleness, His self-control. He's called each one of us to bear this kind of spiritual fruit in our lives. So we have to stop and ask ourselves, okay, God has chosen me and He's appointed me to bear fruit. Am I bearing this fruit? The fruit of His Spirit, is it seen in my life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Sometimes we're very loving, but we're not, we don't have a lot of self-control. Sometimes we can be gentle, but we're not faithful. Sometimes we might be peaceful, but we're not patient. Sometimes we might be kind, but we're not living good. You know, God wants all of those fruits to be at work in our lives. Amen? Another kind of fruit he has is the fruit of faith. The fruit of faith. Mark 4, verses 30 to 32 says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. The seed is a product of fruit, and when it grows, it doesn't just produce a piece of fruit, but the mustard seed produces this large tree that other animals can come and nest in and find shelter in. I think of that, that when our faith as Christians grow, our faith becomes a place that draws others who do not have faith to come and find shelter, because we're believing in God and because our faith is strong. God wants our faith in our lives to grow. Luke 17, 6, it says, So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. God has appointed us to be people of the fruit of the Spirit. He's appointed us to bear fruit of faith in our lives. Faith that can move mountains. Faith that can, that can move and shake the earth. Faith that can do things in the supernatural. And Matthew 28, 19 talks about the other fruit that he wants us to bear. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You see, the other fruit that he wants us to bear are other lives who find Christ. You know, God doesn't want you just to bear faith and not bear the fruit of discipleship, of discipling others. He doesn't want you to just bear the fruit of discipling others and not bear the fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't want you just to bear the fruit of the Spirit and have no faith. He wants all of these fruit to be productive in our lives. What happens if you have a tree and it fails to produce fruit? I remember living in a parsonage and out in the backyard, we had seven or eight different fruit trees. And so if we had a couple of different cherry trees, we had some pear trees, we had some apple trees, two different kinds of apples. And you know, there's one apple tree that wasn't bearing anything. It's like, let's cut this thing down. <coughs> I didn't feel like cutting it down. I did it, but they eventually got cut down because it did nothing. It had no purpose. God wants us to bear fruit. The next thing is he wants that fruit to last. You know what I'm saying? That you should bear fruit. Let's go back to that verse in John 15. Would you William, please? comes. Thank you. I have called you friends for all that I have made known for my Father and made known to you. Go down to the next one, please. Verse 16. You do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. In other words, he wants our faith to stand. He wants the fruit of the Spirit to stand. And he wants us to reach out and make disciples that will also stand for him. He wants the fruit of his kingdom being reproduced in other people's lives to go forth. Someone reproduce their, their spiritual life in us. Someone's faith, someone's testimony was shared with you and me. And because of that, it made a difference in our lives. I'm the product of the fruit of many other people's lives. The fruit of Royal Ranger leaders. When I was in Royal Rangers as a kid, the fruit of youth pastors and youth leaders, the fruit of my parents 
who installed it in me. And my life is the result of others installing their fruit, reproducing that in my person. God wants us to do the same and reproduce His faith, His love, His fruits of the Spirit in others. You know, last month at the men's breakfast, we were talking about that, that tree that Jesus walked by, and it had no fruit on it, and He cursed it, and it died. And then interestingly, we brought up the fact that that tree, it wasn't the season for it to be bearing fruit. Yet Christ had an expectation in that moment that it would bear the fruit that it should be bearing. Do you realize there is no off-season for Christians to be bearing fruit? There is no off-season for us to be bearing fruit. And even if there was, 2 Timothy 4.2 says this, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. In other words, it's always season for us to be reproducing fruit in our lives. Fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of faith, the fruit of others finding faith. And God wants Jesus. He has appointed us. He's chosen us. Do you realize that God has chosen you? None of us is exempt from that. He chose you because He valued you, but He also chose you to be His friend. And as His friend, He wants you to be reproducing fruit in this world for the kingdom of God. If you look at your spiritual life and you're not reproducing fruit for the kingdom in your life, God never intended for the church to be fruitless. I look at the modern church of Jesus Christ, though, and I don't see see people reproducing fruit in others. If we were, we'd see people, churches growing, not because because we want to say, I go to that big church and we have all of this going on there. No, because people are getting changed. Lives are being affected. They're being saved. You know, the awesome thing about all of this is that when God appoints us, when He chooses us, and when He ordains us, He also authorizes us. The third thing I want to talk about this morning. We are authorized in Christ's name. Authorized in Christ's name. If you were to go on in that verse that we're looking at, a lot of commentators, when you even go to study them, they actually don't even like to acknowledge this next part of this verse. But it goes on to say that you may ask, whatever you ask in my name, I will give it you. I want you to think about what that means, the authority that that means. Whatever you ask in my name, he may give you, the Father will give you. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got this heavenly credit card that you can go out and command what you want to be yours. Ooh, I like that new Ford 150 Shelby edition. Yeah, Lord, I want that one. You have to give it to me, God. I said, you said whatever I ask in your name, you'll give it to me, right? That's not what it's talking about, is it? It's not what it's talking about. It's in direct, that whatever you ask in my name, it's in direct correlation to the fact that God's ordained us to bear fruit. See, God will give us what we ask in his name that we can be productive in reproducing fruit. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure if a Shelby Ford 150 is going to reproduce fruit. Y'all know what that is. That's the really souped up model. It's only $110,000 at Ford dealership over on 52. I was going to get my car fixed one day. I thought, I go, man, that, that truck's sweet. I wonder how much that is. I'm like, whoo! Twice as much as my first house. Okay. Yeah. But what that means is that Jesus has authorized us to use his name. He's authorized us to go and to stand and to speak in his name, in Jesus' name. To believe in Jesus' name, when we have the authority of someone who has power, that power is then invested in us. And the same Jesus who would sit there and would heal the sick and raise the dead and, 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 and cast out the demon, that same Jesus has given us authority in His name that whatever we ask in His name, it will be given to us. That doesn't mean that when we ask for the mansion or we ask for the monetary things, that's going to give it to us. But you know, if we're asking for provision for the ministry, if we're asking for provision for the things of God, if we're asking for provision to touch lives, so He's going to answer our prayers. He's not going to question that authority belongs to us. But it's in conjunction with us bearing fruit. And so many people have taken it and said, Oh, you can ask for whatever you want in Jesus' name and Jesus will give it to you. It's like, you know, it's, He's not a cosmic vending machine. But he has authorized his church to stand in his power, his authority, his anointing, and accomplish what we need to accomplish on this earth. 
That means that we have authority that when that person doesn't know Christ is sick, we do have authority to pray with them. Now I understand that it's appointed unto man who wants to die, and there are going to be those places for people that they're going to die. And I understand that Christians pass away and Christians get sick and stuff. But I also know that there are places where people have situations and they don't know Christ, and Christ sends us into there. He anoints us to speak over them. To have authority in His Word over what's going on in their lives. To speak to the disease or to speak to the sin or to speak to the, to the, to the oppression that might be in someone's life. And as we speak to it, then it has to go because we have authority in His name that what we ask in His name will be given it. There's a generation, there's a community out here who needs to be found. They need to find freedom in Christ. Not just in Fort Lupton, but in Brighton and in Decono and in and Frederick and Firestone and Platteville and Hudson and all around here. We are a church. We're supposed to be the spiritual church. We've been authorized by Christ to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. He wants to use us. Matthew 10, 8. Jesus says, and as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. He gives us authority over the sick, over the leper, over the dead, over the demons. You and I, we have spiritual authority that we can bear fruit, that that fruit should remain. You know, God never calls us, He never points us to something that He doesn't equip us to do then. And so we're saying, well, Pastor, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of a young Christian. Yep, and you know what? That same authority goes with you. Because whether you've been serving Jesus for 30 years or 3 days, when He chooses you, He chooses you for a purpose. The problem is some of us aren't living out that purpose. Some of us are still doing our own thing. You see, what's one of the important things that he says in that command? He says, there are two things he tells us. He says, I want you to, you're my friends if you obey all things that I've commanded you. It's one of the things he says in that scripture. And the other one says, and that you should love one another. So he's looking for us to walk in obedience to him, and he's looking for us to love one another. We're special to God, and he's chosen us, but he wants us to be obedient to him, And to love one another. And when we come to find Him, when we realize, God picked me for His team, now what does He want me to do when I'm on this team? The King of the universe picked me, and none of us got picked last. You get what I'm saying? He wanted us on His team. He chose you. He chose me. He chose us. He put us here for such a time as this, with a purpose for right now. And He appointed us to bear fruit now. And fruit, not just fruit that, you know, have you ever seen fruit that rots fast? Yes. He doesn't want us to have rotten fruit. He wants the fruit that remains. Fruit that's going to go and reproduce more fruit. And he's not only appointed us, but he's authorized us and given us his power to do those things. He's ordained us and given us what we need to accomplish those things that he's called us to. We have a purpose. God wants you to, and you know what? You can say, well, I'm, you know, Pastor, I'm up in my 80s now. Doesn't matter. You got breath on this earth, he still wants to use you. Until your dying breath, you can still be used. I, there we had a lady in our last church, Sister Ruby. I love Sister Ruby. She was so awesome. Sister Ruby was, I think, 90 or 91 when we went to the church. She's like 96 now, 97. And, Man, she, she, her, she one day just standing there, her hip shattered and she fell to the ground. She, I mean, she was, Sister Ruby was old. She's been around a long time. Sister Ruby had to go to a sister living center. But man, let me tell you, Sister Ruby never stopped preaching Jesus. Never stopped. When she was still in her home, she was still bringing kids to church. She was still talking about bringing them in. She got to that nursing home and, and, and God would bring her into people's rooms and would lead her to people right before they died and she'd pray with them and they'd come to find Jesus. Amen. Be with them in those last hours. And she'd go and she'd be like, Pastor, I'm here and some of these people, they're just so ungodly and stuff, but she's like, I gotta be a light. She was concerned about being a light. It didn't matter. She didn't care if she was 95 years old. She still needed to be that light and she still needed to be speaking the words of Jesus to other people and she was still gonna be a part of it because until she died, she was gonna go out preaching Jesus. That's how God wants us to live. He's chosen us. He's appointed us. He's authorized us. And you say, well, I thought I was special to God. Why did he put all that on me? Because he sees the value in us. And what? He sees our value and our potential and our ability. Do you see it in yourself? Do you see yourself as God sees you today? 
Do you sit there and say, oh, I can't do that, or I shouldn't do that, I don't have time for that? Or do we say, you know, Lord, the things that you have in store for my life are more important than anything I have in store for my life? You know, we spend 40 hours a week going out to make money for ourselves and stuff, and then, and then we don't have time to give anything else to God. But do we set apart time to say, God, what you want me to do is more important than anything else that I do? God, use me. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for appointing me. Thank you for empowering me. Because he's authorized us to ask whatever we will in his name, that he'll give it if we're doing it to bear the fruit that remains. Would you bow your heads with me this morning?